Well, good evening. My name is Julie Riccardi, and I have the privilege of being one of the board members of the Raleigh Ringers here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we're happy to welcome you, sadly, uh, to the very last roundtable for this summer. So we're excited that you're with us on this holiday weekend, um, or at least it's a weekend for me. We got to choose whether we wanted Friday or Monday off, so I chose Monday. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are also uh, taking advantage of a wonderful weekend. We're excited tonight. We hope that as we begin this call, you um, put in the chat where you're from, say hello to each other. We'd love to see um, where you are and who you are associated with. And we welcome you tonight to take a virtual visit to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where earlier we heard that it's uh, nice and hot, 90 degrees and a little bit rainy season. But tonight's gonna be wonderful because we are gonna get a virtual tour uh, the Shulmer Bells uh, Company LLC and Bethan Neely is going to take us through that tour um, with a video and then answer some questions for us all. So be writing down your questions and thinking about what you want to ask her at the end of our program. Welcome, Bethan. Thank you for having me. So let's jump right in. I think I'll just jump Sorry in. Okay, good. We are having some audio issues. So no worries. You you can all hear, just not this video yet. There we go. Share okay. sound. That should work. Let's try again. Bell's first arrived with us at the factory as raw castings, which need to be machined down in order to become musical instruments. Most castings can become at least two notes, for instance, C and C sharp, D and D sharp, etc. And the smaller castings can be more notes than that. For instance, this guy can be an A6, B6, C7, or any of the sharps in there. As you can see right now, the wall of the casting is very thick, so you can't really ring it the way you can with a bell. But that's where our machining comes in. My name is Frank. I run the horses and the manuals on the other side. This is the uh, offside house. And once we get the raw castings like this after we center them, then we run the outside here, just clean up the outside, and this is what we end up with. This will be the finished one coming off of here. And this is the, the inside house. We got one bell in there now that I'm working on. And that cleans up the inside and it gets it to a point to where uh, we're ready to do the rough tuning on uh, Victor's, which is an automatic lathe. Okay, so just take a bell that we run off the of bottom. We have different size rings for each bell. So you go here, you find the program that you're working on with the belt, and you type the program in. That's all set up, already have it set up. And then you put your starting your setup numbers in, which I have them here.
Tyson makes a starting cut. And it cuts it down to this number here, which is, which is my target number. A series of cuts to pull this down to that number. But you don't want to take off so much material at a time. And before I cut it, it's not going to do it. Before I cut it, it's not going to do it. This is probably a couple more tires. But to get down to that pedal, I have to take more material off of it. This is a bell that's done, and that's what it's doing. which I was working on. I this is the same stuff, same, but I have to get the net the, the, the actual note is that number and the twelfth note is this number. And that's the separation between that I have to get between the notes. Take material off so you get the crossover within like 10 cents difference of each note. So like this is B5 and my 12th note is B7. It's already on here. So that's the two notes I gotta get within a 10 cent range. And same same thing. Uh, but yeah, pretty much the same procedure. Just I gotta it's a little more difficult because I gotta keep these numbers the same.
like that, it's ready for the next step. Uh, all the pedals come to these two machines except for the bigger ones. This goes up to a G2. And then after that, these bigger pedals, like this, I got three here. We'll do the outside on the house and then we'll go to the manuals. This is for C3s, we got four machines, the really big bells, the C2s and bigger ones, the outsides, so they're doing it on the Haas, we do it on the machine way down the end, and uh, that does the bigger bells on the outside. Unlike the automatic machines, you have to constantly watch this, if you're not, you have to stop the machine when it gets to the end. We gotta take the bells out manually, and then you bring them over, to the meter, the Peterson meter, and then we tune it to where we're almost at where we need to be before it goes into polishing and then the tuning room. Hi. Hi, my name's Adam. I'm here at Showmark working in the polishing room. We do refurbished bells and new bells as well that come off the Haas that uh, Frank does and Jim does. Over here we have, these are new bells that came from the CNC's and the Victor's that you've seen in previous video. Um, this is what it looks like before it's sanded and polished. Um, but today we'll just show you refurbished bells. These are, this is a 61 that came in, 61 note that came in. and needs just polish, make it shine. Um, you can see the color difference inside outside. Um, and yeah, I'll show you a quick little cleanup video. <laughs>
So what I do is I kind of set it up here on my little makeshift um, piece here, and I just kind of ding around the bell. So then the tablet shows me what note the bell is and how high it is. So this is a C5. And it's about 14 to 15 high at some spots. So what I do then is I come over to the grinder and we have to grind it down into tolerance. Um, each note has its own, own tolerance um, for, the, for the bell. So what I do is I just tuck it up in here. It's a little loud, so. <laughs> spot there some people call it like the wedding band mark where it, um, hopefully it's round down and so what I do is we have our little stick we put this on and this just lets me be able to move the bell around freely so I use the C5 yoke assembly I just hook it up and then as you can see it lets me move the the handle will move around with the clapper assembly. So what I like to do is I just put like a little pencil mark. Um, that's just my starting point so I know uh, for listening around the bell. And then what you do is you just, I just ring the bell and I listen to it and try to find the nicest sounding spot of the bell. And as I do that, I'm turning the bell just a little bit at a time. And I'll do that all the way around the bell until I find a spot that I like. Once I find a spot that I like, I put a pencil mark there. And then I go back around and I try to, um, if there's several marks, I eliminate them to the one that I like the best. And then we scribe them. So was, say I like that spot there, so what I'll do is I'll take this off and then I scribe it, I take my marker, um, I take this, I have a ruler and then we have a sharp point and what I do is I hold this up and I pull down and I put the scribe line in there and then I drill a hole into the top part and then when we take it out onto the floor and we assemble it, everything matches up to that scribe. So when you put your pin in and your disc, your handle and your yoke assembly, it'll adjust to fall right at that scribe spot. My name is Carol and we're gonna be belt building today. So let's see. <clears throat> we lay out our bells, we lay out our parts, which I have to pull some, some more parts. So while you're watching, I'll be Parts, and then we'll get started on building bells. This is a reefer that we're building back, so um, a little different than brand new bells. Handles. Um, 
them all the way. And I kind of make it um, an es essentially like a pattern. Of, um, so I don't have any parts made at the end of the, <laughs> they all go together. And uh, <clears throat> so get them all at that stage. And we're going to make a little bit of noise. And then I might have to adjust it later. Right on down the line. Every bell to specs. Then we go with our handles. Okay. It's a little process here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Put, put the little spacer. The little spacer goes in. Upside down. Twist until we hear a little click. And that means the pin has gone into its hole. And pull it down. If it's not in, it's going to not go, it's, the, the screw's not going to go down. Um, then it's safe to lift it up. And then we got a lot of play until we adjust the next part. So I do one bell at a time all the way down. Uh, so I'm using my parts. And so now we go to where we're going to adjust it. So we're going to play with the settings first. All right, we're going to put it on medium. And we're lining it up. So the medium is lined up at the strike point. Okay. And then we line the handle up as best we can because it's going to move because I'm not done. Then we do our, we bring it up a bit on both sides. All right. And then too much rocking because it shouldn't be hitting. So we want playfulness, but no hitting the sides until we're ready to hit the side. And I also at that point turn it over and kind of tighten it once I think it's all lined up. So what I'm looking for, and you can see this, is the it should be in line with the G, right? Then you pick it up and it's following that same line to the strike point. So everything is is straight. Straight. That's a little bit. So at that point is when I'm not getting the rocking as much. So then I then I can actually hit it. I can actually hit it, hear the sound, and then I do the back the back. Take the tolerance. And it's coming up plus plus one. Don't hear too much of a wow. So at that point, once it's all tight and it's straight and it's ringing good, and we've got the tolerance, that's pronounced ready to be polished and backed. So when we have a refurbishment to do, we 
lay out our bells. We take the tolerance and then the whole bell comes apart. So all the parts come off, including the pin comes out. Then we scribe the top so we know what the bell uh, note is. They all go on a cart. Um, if we're doing a complete, all of the parts will be thrown away. And then we start with brand new ones. If we're doing an evaluation, we have to go through all the parts and extra stress. And cracks on the disc. We are looking at whether or not the clappers food, uh, hard, snapping, and, um, and the handles, whether there's stress white marks here, are they, are they uh, chewed, if they're in bubbles, which are all signs that, that the handle might be ready to go. And you don't, worst thing in the world is to have it built back onto a bell with a handle that once you pick it up and you ring the bell, it snaps and the bell goes across the room. <laughs> We don't want that, we don't want that. Um, so then the bells all go on a um, cart and they, get, they go back to our polisher uh, to look nice and pretty. And then the whole process starts over there and the, the, we build them back again. Hi. Adam here again. We're here in the chime room. Going to do a little demonstration of how we tune chimes. Um, so what we do here is we grab whatever note we need, whatever note we're tuning. Uh, here I have an A4. So what we usually do is just to double check, make sure it's marked right. We have our scope here. We just give it a little ring. And if it's a uh, natural, it'll come up the note before, so it's saying it's a sharp, but we have to actually tune it first. So I'll come over here. Get it set up already. And then it will be loud, just so you know. We do have a sheet here with all of our notes, and it tells us, it gives us an estimate of how close. Um, how many cents we need to take off the chime. So, an A4. Is 105 cents, so it will be a little loud, just, just so you know. takes off too much and then you have a waste of time. So just can come over here, bring it. So what we're looking for is to be um, zero to plus five. Right now we're at plus ten so we need to take off a little more. Plus five. We could even take off a little more, but that should be fine. When we scrape it, it even comes down a little more. When we use the scraper, we just get the sharp edges off from where we uh, had to tune the chime. Plus four, perfect. So then I can come over here and show you how to plug the chime next. All we do is take, find the right size plug. Put it in here, we have different notes here. 
different sizes, different plugs we use. These plugs are a little tight fit, so just get our mallet, hit them in a little bit. Four chime tuned and plugged, ready to go. So here we just got done tuning the A4 that you guys witnessed. Um, so we're over here in the building process. Um, so what we do is we have our A4 shaft. This is not complete. What we need to do is get our thumb piece, our bumpers, and whether it takes uh, a nylon. Um, head or just a regular this style uh, head or not so what we do is come over here we get our screws Now this isn't ready to go, we still have to adjust it. Just come around here. I like to keep the slots facing away from the set screw, this way the set screw actually bites on better and it doesn't wear out faster. What I'm doing here is tightening the set screw. I tighten it in pretty good, not too hard. And then see the shaft don't drop. And then I just unloosen, unloosen the set screw just a little bit until it falls. And then you adjust your bumper. And that's, uh, that's how you build an A4. And then we have to paint inside here, inside here, and then we get our A4 labels. Silver melody bells. We refer to them as SMBs um, that we tune and can build. Also, um, the difference between the SMB cans are they're flat versus our regular bells that has a tang. So these are done the same way. We grind them. We uh, check the tolerance. We grind them down the same way as we do a regular bell. Um, the only thing is we have like a little adapter that holds it on because it doesn't have the tang. And then. We uh, grind them, we tune them, and then we take them out and we build them. Uh, they have, like, I think, a softer sounding um, versus our, our regular bells. They have a, a, like a softer medley type sound, I think. Um, uh, uh, that's pretty much about these. We have all different ranges. We go from C5 to um, C7, so, and some of them are a little bit higher, we grind them down a little bit more because they, they are the same size notes for um, a couple notes. Uh, this is what they look like before they go out to get plated. They, um, they're brass and then we send them out like that, they look like this and then when they come back they look like this. And then we pop, build them, we'll polish them, put them in the case and um, send them out for the customer's orders. All right, so there you have it.
I think we've got a few questions. Um, there were a couple sent in the chat. Let me just go back to that. All right, so the first question we got was from Mitchell asking what makes it the best spot? Um, so that's going back to in the tuning room when we were going around the bell, ringing it at every point around the circumference. So that's really, um, that's the place more so than anywhere in the process of making the bells where it, you have to have a really excellent ear. So when Wendy's in the tuning room, she's listening to every spot on the bell to determine which spot has the steadiest tone, the least um, least vibrato, the least additional overtones that get involved um, wherever you're getting basically the purest sound of the bell. So it really does take a very close ear, especially when you're working on the same note, you might have 10 of the same note in a row and you're listening to 10 C5s trying to figure out where is the best spot on that bell? So it takes a lot of patience, takes, again, a really good ear. Um, and then there was another question um, asking when this video was recorded. So this was recorded just last month. Uh, we actually didn't have a, a pre-recorded video tour ready to go um, until we were asked by the Rally Ringers to put one together. So we filmed and edited this just the past month. It was very recent. Any other questions? How many orders depend on, um, it's not an easy question, I guess, to answer how many orders we receive. Um, we also get orders for any number of bells. So we could get, you know, maybe um, five, 10, 20 orders a week, 30 orders a week, depending on the week. But some of those orders might be for just one bell, two bells, three bells. Some of those orders might be for um, octave sets. So we've got two octaves is 25 notes three octaves is 37 notes, four is 49, five octaves is 61, each octave being 12 or 13 bells with the first one. Um, so you'll hear in the video, you heard a little bit, Adam referring to a 61 note set. The people who work there primarily will say 61 note, 49 note, 37 note instead of the octaves, just because that's easier for them to keep track of. Um, but I would say depending on the week, we can run um, maybe 10 octaves of bells a week it varies a pretty good amount. Um, so how long to finish one hand bell? Um, that again, depends. We usually don't do one bell from start to finish um, because it makes more sense for the machines to run five at a time of each. Um, you get sets going through it once, but I would say um, if you were to do one bell from start to finish, it would probably take about an hour, uh, maybe two, but um, it, it is a lot more time efficient to go through both sets at the same time. Uh, let's see. So none of the machines uh, were specifically made for bells. Um, one of the questions we got was that some of the machines seem to be pretty standard, things like a drill press. Did any have to be specifically made for bells? None of them were specifically made for bells, but a lot of them were specifically customized not just for bells, but specifically what we do with the bells. So all of the machines, all of the programming for the machining that you saw at the beginning of the video is our own custom programming. Um, the Haas machines, there's a specific program that was written for each note. And then the Victor machines, um, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated where you saw that Jim was having to go in and make multiple cuts on each bell. That's because each casting is different. So the Haas can get it through to the rough tuning where you have a program for the D sharp five. It gets you close enough to a D sharp five, but then every casting is a little bit different. And so there's programs telling you what you're aiming for and how to take off a few cents at a time. But again, with each casting, you can only do a small amount because each one's gonna be different. Um, same thing with the manual machines. Those ones, every bell is a little bit different. And that's why you saw even after the bells go through machining and polishing, once they get to the tuning room, they're usually still a little bit high, which is our variance, because if it goes too low, then the bell is ruined. So it's better to have it a little bit high and then cut down. Uh, so if you're shaving the bell and you go too far, it depends on um, whether it's a bell or a chime. It goes depends on how far you go. So if you're, say, only one cent below tolerance, for reference, there's 100 cents in every half step when you're talking about pitch. 
So if a half step is 100 cents, five cents is not a very noticeable amount. So if you're down by one, maybe two cents, that's probably okay, but that's why we do tend to aim on the high side because you can always take more off. You can't put more material back on. With the chimes, if you take a tiny bit off too much by mistake, you can cut the top of the chime down ever so slightly, and that will bring your pitch up again. So cutting down the slots brings the pitch down, cutting a little bit off the top would bring it up, but we can't do that with the bells. Um, there's other things we do with bells that don't pass for sound quality if they get messed up, if their pitch is wrong, if they just don't have a spot that sounds good, if you go around the casting and you can't find a spot that has a good steady tone. We make decorative engraved bells with the larger ones and then the smaller bells turn into our Christmas ornaments. Um, worst case scenario, if it can't be used for anything like that, all of the shavings and any rejected bells go back to our foundry and get melted down and recast into new castings. Um, how many employees do we have? Um, so currently we have the five employees that you saw in this video are our full-time production staff. We also have two more part-time production staff, and then we have four employees in the office. And there's a lot of people who will swing, I guess, five employees in the office. And a lot of us, almost everyone is cross-trained in some way. Those of us in the office will swing into production to do what is needed. Um, those in production, you saw Adam was in the polishing room and the chime room. Wendy, who was in tuning, can also do chimes and also does bell assembly. Um, the guys are cross-trained across a, several of the machines. Jim, who was running the Victors, also does polishing and chimes as well. So there's a lot of crossover, a lot of people who are able to jump in wherever they're needed. But we do run a pretty bare bones operation. Um, so we have a question about handles. How did Schulmerk arrive at the decision to make such a significant change in the type of handle? Um, so you didn't really see this in the video. The bells we saw assembled was a refurbished set of bells. So they had our older traditional handles, which are a vinyl strap with um, rivets holding them to a block at the base. This is based on the original English handbells, which were made from leather straps um, back way before vinyl was invented. Um, so it's based on that aesthetic. About five, maybe six years or so ago now, we switched to a newer version of handles, which we call pro handles. They're a hard molded plastic material. They're a single piece, the edges are a little bit more rounded. Um, and then they're, like I said, a harder, more rigid material. The impetus for that decision was that um, the original source we had where we were getting the um, material for the handles, um, that source went out of business very suddenly. And so we were no longer able to source the original handles we had. When it came down to looking for new sources for material, um, new management at the time said, well, why don't we think about the handle, you know, think about a redesign since we're in this position, you know, does it really need to be the same style handle we had or can we do something a little different? And so that's where they ended up with the pro handles. Um, they're definitely different. They feel a little different. They function exactly the same. They're compatible with older bells as well. Um, but they have gotten a fair amount of mixed reviews and we've worked on a few generations of the pro handles since we've had them. Um, but the biggest benefit to them is that they do offer a little bit more of a rigid grip. Um, let's see. The units at the end seem to be different than the standard handbells. If so, do you have a finished example? Um, stock blank units. Yes, yeah, so the silver melody bells, I think, is what you were asking about. The ones that were um, a cylindrical can rather than a traditional bell shape. Um, so once they're assembled, they're exactly the same. It's the same type of handle, same type of clapper. The only thing that's different about them is the shape and material and the casting itself. So standard handbells are made from bronze. The silver melody bells, as Wendy said, are brass plated in nickel. And then the difference in the shape changes the overtones. So the overtones out of a bell shape, you have a different series of overtones. From a, a cylinder, you have less overtones than you would from a bell. that's all the questions in the chat so far. If anyone has any other questions, fire away. Uh, Mitchell asks, if he orders a set of bells, are they cast in response to the order or do we have sets ready to go? Um, so it's a mix of both. We don't start from scratch with every order, but we don't have sets pre-built either. So we try to keep in the tuning room a fair, say five to 10 of each bell that are tuned, have been machined um, and can are ready then to be assembled. 
but we don't necessarily always have five to 10 of each ballot every time, depending on what's going on in production, we may be waiting on one of a specific note and they're never assembled ready to go. So even if we have all of the castings ready, they're still then assembled for your order, which is why our standard production time is usually around four weeks or so for bell orders. So there was a question about the new handles that the harder plastic material is slippery. Um, so that is one of the comments we've gotten back. In the base handles, you don't really do too much four in hand, so that doesn't matter um, as much, but the material does have a little bit more texture now in the most recent designs of the base handles. And the treble handles, we're still working on that, um, testing that COVID has slowed down the testing process a little bit because um, bell groups have obviously slowed down. I think all of you are aware this year that there's just been a little bit less ringing than we really would like there to be. Um, so one of the prototypes that we have for the treble handles um, will add a little bit of a rubber insert that should make them less slippery. But again, we're still working on testing that. Um, let's see, during the history of the company, have we ever considered making any other products that didn't really make it? Um, well, the silver melody bells that you saw at the end actually were originally um, produced in the 80s. They offered them for just a couple of years and then stopped. Um, there wasn't really a good reason for why they stopped. I think they, um, from the production side of things, hadn't really quite figured out how to eff efficiently make them as instruments, but they had been popular. There was a great demand for them. And so those vintage silver melody bells that were originally manufactured in the 80s had been a really hot commodity for several decades. And then it was about five or six years ago that um, when the company went under new ownership, someone brought up the topic of silver melody bells and said, oh yeah, those used to be really popular. We only made them for a couple of years, but everyone loved them. And so we went back, revisited that and brought them back into our permanent rotation. So that was one product that originally didn't make it, but came back. Uh, we also offered for a while um, something called a melody wave, which was a digital system with chimes. Um, it was a MIDI system. It was an interesting concept, but it was something that um, that at the time the technology to make it really successful wasn't there. Um, it was a little bit more complicated than most people could really get their minds around. And so that never really went off the ground. Um, and then at this point, by the time we looked into revisiting that, the technology had already far surpassed where we were when we first started with that product. There's so many MIDI sound control systems now that there really isn't a need for ours that we originally started with. Um, let's see. Um, I can't really speak to the production of Whitechapel. I've never been to their facility. I do know that they are um, the oldest handbell manufacturer. They started making handbells um, right back at the beginning. They've been in business since I believe the 1400s. Um, so I would imagine that their process is um, a little bit, well, obviously older. Their machining would be older. There's elements with all of the companies, I'm sure where we have changed over the years. When Schulmerk first started making handbells, obviously the machining would have been manual because that was back in the 60s. There wasn't quite as much automated machinery. We've adapted over time. I'm sure Whitechapel has as well. Um, I do know they still use leather handles for their handbells. Um, so there's a lot more tradition, I think, in their manufacturing. But again, I don't work for Whitechapel and I've not been there, so I can't really speak too much on them. Um, I have worked at Schulmerk for coming up on four years now. Before that, I was an avid handbell ringer. So I had a lot of experience in the world of handbells before starting at Schulmerk. Um, but I've been there at this company almost four years. And I have worked at um, a number of the manufacturing stations. I haven't operated any of the, um, the bell machines or the polishing equipment, but I have um, done some time with bell assembly and tuning as well as chime assembly and tuning. Um, so I'm pretty well versed in whatever's going on with everyone, even if I haven't always operated all of the machinery. Um, I, I know a lot about what goes into the process of all of it. Um, so specific roles that I've held, um, I am have worked in customer service and re refurbishments, coordinating and scheduling the refurbishment work. Um, I, like I mentioned, have done a little bit uh, moving around in production, mainly because I think that as a customer service and office, office representative, it's important to know what's happening behind the scenes and to really know what I'm talking about. Um, most recently, I've moved into a little bit of a production management 
role where I'm starting to schedule the machinists, um, scheduling what bells go out the door, um, making sure that we've got all the castings we need for all the orders that are coming in. Um, and yes, um, so digital Merc once also make larger bells, like the kind you'd find in bell towers in schools or churches. So when Schulmerk was founded back in 1935, that was originally what they did. They were making some larger bells, but then they also very quickly figured out that it's possible to make um, tower bell systems without actually making full-size bells. So the bells that would go in a carillon or a tower are usually very, very large and obviously more expensive because of the larger amount of material used. Um, so the first invention really that made Schulmerk stand out amongst their competitors was that George Schulmerk figured out that by using just rods of bronze, but amplifying them, you could get the same sound that you would get from a large bell. So many of the original Schulmerk tower bell and carillon bell systems aren't actually full-size bells. They're just rods of metal that are struck and then amplified to sound like a full bell. Then later Schulmerk moved into making digital carillon bell systems, um, which we now no longer do. That's under uh, a separate company that manages those instruments. But it was in the 60s that we found really our main area of success, which was handbells. Caught up on questions for now, but there's still time for a few more, I think. Have we had a memorable custom order? Um, well, one of the things that we do. Um, we only take this order about every four years, but we'll make four of them, um, is that if you're a college football fan at all, you might know the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Um, it's not one of the larger bowls within college football, but um, they are famous for the fact that the winning team receives a replica of the Liberty Bell. And so we actually make those where we are. Uh, we cast those Liberty Bells, we assemble them on a wooden stand and um, put the plaque together, all of that. Um, so that's a fun little thing that we do. Um, it is a custom order. We're not allowed to make those for anyone else other than AutoZone. And we send out um, three or four of those every three or four years. So they buy a few trophies in advance. Um, so that's something fun we do. We also have made a couple of smaller um, desktop replica bells as well. I'm trying to think if there's been any other custom orders while I've been there. Well, we get the engraved silent bells that I mentioned earlier. So castings that don't pass our sound quality inspection um, for some reason can be engraved with custom messages. We get a lot of those. We do those as memorial items. Um, we do those as congratulations. Sometimes people will get them as a graduation gift, a retirement gift, something like that. Uh, so that's a common custom order that we do. Uh, do the custom Liberty Bells come pre-cracked? So they are not actually cracked, the trophy bells, but they do have a crack that's molded into the casting. Um, so they don't look like a regular bell. They're a little bit more stylized. They've got like a little rim to them. Um, they're a, a specific mold and they're not tuned to a specific note because they don't need to be as a musical instrument, but they do have a crack that's molded in. Um, is it physically possible to detune a bell by hand polishing your bell? Um, not by hand polishing or certainly not by hand polishing, except you know, maybe over a very, very, very long period of time. Um, very small trace amounts of material do get removed every time you polish the bells, but by hand polishing, you're not removing very much. Um, our buffing wheels do lower the pitch of the bells. And so when we do the refurbished bells, we're very careful to only do light passes over them because it is possible to detune the bell by polishing it too hard on the buffing wheel. That's something where sometimes we'll have refurbished bells that have been through a lot. Maybe they've been water damaged, maybe they um, have been exposed to chemicals, um, smoke or fire. And there are times when we can't quite remove all of the marks. Sometimes we can remove enough of the marks that we will still send them back to the customer and say, you know, the bells are shined up, they're in much better condition than what they came in. There's very small marks that you probably wouldn't even notice. There have been, I think, two, one or two sets since I've been there that were so badly water damaged that they could not be polished, that 
they were rusty and oxidized. And even after polishing, those rust spots would come back within a matter of hours. That was the one set I'm thinking of specifically had been through Hurricane Katrina and had then been kept in storage for about five years, 10 years after Hurricane Katrina, before someone had the money and the funds available to be able to send those bells in for refurbishment. So at that point, they were damaged beyond, beyond repair. Um, does Schulmerk have a recommendation as to the best method of hand polishing and best products to use for hand polishing? Um, so we recommend using Simichrome polish if you're using a polishing paste. Um, you can also just use polishing cloths. There's a couple different levels. If you're wiping your bells down on a regular basis, you can just use a plain cloth, a soft rag, microfi microfiber cloth, something like that to take off fingerprints. Um, there's also sunshine polishing cloths or um, dual surface polishing cloths that have a rouge layer in the middle. Both of those are popular for use um, on a regular basis as well. They're a little bit more in depth than a microfiber cloth. They'll take off more residue. And then on maybe an annual basis, you might want to use a polishing paste. And so we recommend Simichrome. Um, and we recommend that it uh, be applied li a light layer to the outside of the bell, allowed to dry, and then buffed off with a clean, soft cloth. Um, it's important to apply it only to the outside of the bell and not the inside. As you saw, our bells, um, when they go through polishing, they're only polished to a jeweler's finish on the outside. We don't polish the insides. And so, as you saw when we were in tuning, the inside still has small ridges, machine marks, grinding marks, a little bit of texture to it. So, if you use polishing paste on the inside, that will get trapped inside those ridges and the chemicals in the polish will continue to eat away at the metal. That's why we only suggest that the bells be polished on the outside. If the inside gets dirty, you can use just a plain cloth, um, even a soft um, scratchy pad like you might use on your pots and pans, but nothing that has any type of chemicals that could get into those ridges. Um, is tuning affected by temperature? Um, cold bells are flat. It is very slightly affected by temperature. So it's not going to change much, but you might get a difference of a few cents depending on the temperature. We try to keep everywhere in our warehouse very temperate. Our employees especially appreciate that, that we're kind of temperature hangs around 70 all the time. And we also have dehumidifiers in the tuning room, in the chime room, um, and anywhere where the bells are stored for a long period of time to make sure that they're kept at an even humidity level. Any other questions? If there aren't any other questions, I'll, I'll uh, say we're so thrilled to um, end on such a bang <laughs> um, with this presentation. It's been amazing to learn about this. And um, I didn't think about this until you said it, but Purdue played Missouri in the Liberty Bowl in 1980 and won. So I'm wondering how far back you went back and uh, made those, but that I would be curious to see if they have a trophy. Um, that's pretty neat. Yeah. We're so thrilled that you were with us tonight. The tour was great. Your questions, um, your ability to answer every question as they came was just phenomenal. So we're, we're thrilled. If you can do a little applause on your Zoom, go ahead and do that. Um, and uh, we're, we're so happy to end in this way. Carol, we even loved your cat. I saw your cat enjoying this as well. <laughs> um, we hope that you'll continue to uh, take, a, take a look at the Raleigh Ringer Facebook and stay connected with each other and with us. We've been thrilled to have so many programs um, throughout this COVID time and the pandemic and also be able to stay connected in a way that we never thought before virtually. So we're really appreciative of you putting this video together for tonight because I think it was a wonderful platform to get our conversation going. So enjoy the um, rest of your summer days and months that we have left and we will see you again, we hope soon. Um, but thank you, Bethan, for all of your great information. Thank and good you. job on the applause, everybody. Yes, thank you all for the applause and thank you, Julian, to the Raleigh Ringers for having me. Have a good night.